Our next speaker is uh, Jeanette Kutleski. Uh, she's from the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, and she will talk about multi-scale modeling exemplified in the basal ganglia, and she also plans on giving a brief update on the Swedish INCF nodal activities. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, I, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's particularly nice to, to leave Sweden this time of the year and go to a warm place like this. So <clears throat> I will discuss um, some uh, modeling we have done in the basal ganglia uh, on uh, several scales. And uh, uh, when I, I uh, sort of read the uh, program for the workshop, it was supposed to be like integration uh, or um, sensory motor integration. So I, I, will, um, I will sort of pick examples that relate to synaptic integration. I sort of realize that it's not so strict, but <laughs> I, so I, I will not uh, discuss like more general things. I will um, highlight work we have done which so, sort of relates to synaptic uh, uh, integration. So on the, so we, we have been doing work on uh, Maybe like this. So we, we have been doing work on uh, different levels, sort of with the general goal of understanding how uh, cortical, uh, cortical or thalamic input can be processed through the basal ganglia and reach the output stages, which, which in turn control these motor centers in the brainstem and, and thalamus. And, and of course, on the systems level, one can ask a lot of interesting questions, but uh, here I will just discuss an example where, where we have started to look at the role of um, short-term plasticity in, 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 um, in the system. Uh, if we want to understand the basal ganglia on the systems level and how it gates uh, and processes information uh, from the cortex and so on, then of course it's, it's uh, necessary to also go into in detail and look at the different st stages and how is the neural network looking and what are the membrane properties and, and so on. So on the sort of neural network level I will discuss some work uh, related to uh, synaptic integration in, in two different kinds of neurons in the input stage of the basal ganglia. And when you start to discuss the, the uh, neural network level, then you quite soon come, come uh, start to ask questions that really relates to learning and how the connectivity is affected by activity and so on. And then you are already on the subcellular level. And on the subcellular level, we can identify and investigate rules for for learning, for synaptic plasticity, and so on. And if, if we can discover those rules and understand some of the prerequisites on this level, then of course we, we can make some much more educated guesses how, how the input is, is working on this level and probably also on this level. So I will start with the microcircuitry level or the neural network level because that is sort of in, in between. So, uh, in the input stage of the basal ganglia, most of the cells are medium spiny neurons. And those are the only cells that actually project to the next step stage of the basal ganglia. It's like 90% or so of all the cells that are medium spiny neurons. And since those are the only cells that project to the next st stage, it's, it's really important to understand how they process cortical and thalamic input and convey it to, to the next stage. And, and um, several factors uh, are in play here, of course. We have the connectivity in, in the synapses, of course, the connectivity strength from cortex. Another factor could be like modulatory substances su such as dopamine or acetylcholine or serotonin and so on. And a third factor is uh, 
uh, inhibition from neighboring neurons and particularly uh, fast spiking into neurons, feed forward inhibition from fast spiking into neurons. So I, I will start by um, discussing some modeling work we did on fast spiking into neurons a couple of years ago. So the fast spike into neurons, they provide powerful feed forward inhibition to these medium spiny neurons. And these neurons are also coupled with, with um, gap junctions, electrical synapses. So if, if we have several of those presynaptic to uh, medium spiny neurons and they are coupled by gap junctions, then the question was whether um, these gap junctions make them spike synchronized because if they synchronize then of course they could control spike timing in medium spiny neurons uh, quite uh, extensively. So the starting point was a uh, uh, quite detailed fast spike into neuron model we had uh, built earlier. It is compartmentalized and, and with uh, Hosking Huxley currents and we made particular effort into placing out uh, synaptic, um, AMPA and GABA synaptic um, synapses over their uh, cell surface to be able to reproduce um, postsynaptic current uh, amplitude relationships and postsynaptic current inter event interval um, distributions and during like ongoing activity in, in in vivo, but uh, unfortunately there exists no data from in vivo studies, so the best thing that one can do is, is to take uh, data from, for instance, cook cultures. That is at least much more, much better than guessing. So this is sort of a starting point, and it means also that when we, when we simulate this cell, we can also pretend that it is sitting in, in, a, in a network. So then the question is, if we want to understand how a network of gap junction coupled fast spike into neurons can affect a postsynaptic medium spiny neuron, then we also have to see what kind of network that a, a postsynaptic medium spiny neuron might, uh, might be affected through. And this is a reasonable network, like 10 neurons, 5, 10 neurons. It has been estimated that uh, it should be 4 or 2 maybe up to 20 seven fast spike into neurons that could project to one medium spiny neuron. So this is a reasonable network that one can play around with. And then it's also known that gap junctions occur between these neurons to, to some extent. So we simulate these neurons when they are driven, activated by synaptic input. And also uh, these neurons, they are not identical. They, they have variable cell properties, as you have heard earlier today, could be very important. Otherwise, you for sure run into a lot of artifacts because the cells are identical. And also, one can set, tune the gap junction strength to, to, to um, try to reproduce what has been measured. And then, this is an example of when you activate this network with synaptic, simulated synaptic input, then the cell spikes, different cells with different colors, uh, of course, and um, then the, the question is whether, whether it is so that these spikes are synchronized because of the gap junctions or, or not, or to, to what extent they are synchronized. And then uh, one way to illustrate that, so that you see it with, with the eye, is to, to make a histogram of all the different interspike intervals that, that you see uh, among these spikes. And if you simulate this network over a certain time period and do that, then it could look like this if you have no gap junctions in this uh, tensile network. So there, there are no really preferred interspike intervals, of course. But if you uh, reproduce the same si uh, simulation, the identical simulation for the same amount of time, but you uh, introduce gap junctions, then it looks like this, that. So first of all, uh, you see that there are fewer interspike intervals compared to this one, and that is, means it's fewer spikes, right? And there is a, a peak in, in the middle, close to zero, which means that there is a tendency that we have uh, some, some um, spikes occurring quite close in time. 
but the do dominating effect is re this reduction in, in spikes. So this is uh, spike per occurrences in such a network if you, if you increase gap junctions conductance. And if you just look at cells that are coupled uh, with the gap junctions, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't change much. But, but the total effect in the network is a, is a reduction in spikes. And of course, the role of gap junctions it, is probably not just to reduce the number of spikes. That seems to be an inefficient way. Um, so a situation where this could actually make a difference is, is the following one. So if we have um, uh, uh, this network of FS neurons, but they are not coupled by gap junctions, and then you just bombard them with synaptic input, and then during a brief period in time, you, you sort of transient in, increase in, um, in, in, in the synchronicity of the inputs to the different cells, so that these cells sense the same temporal pattern of synaptic input, but you don't change the intensity. So if the cells are not coupled, there is no, no change really, you won't notice anything. But if such a network is coupled with gap junctions, then you see a bump. So a gap junction coupled network is, is very good at picking up short periods of, of, of uh, synchronous inputs. And that is, a, that is um, because what is actually reducing the spike numbers here is, is, is that you shunt current between the, through the gap junctions. And if, if the cells have sort of a similar temporal profile, this is not occurring to the same extent. So if you have, if you put this network as a presynaptic network to a medium spiny neuron and, and this peak is sort of timed to spiking in the medium spiny neuron, it actually appears that you can, um, you can um, delay or even kill 60% uh, more of the spikes with just this presynaptic network. And also I should say that that this is, of course, not exactly how it is in reality. This is more like how it is in reality, that this network is, of course, embedded in a much uh, larger network of FS neurons, but it still works. So this is um, the... Yes, and then what... So first of all, it was a bit un unexpected for, for us that the main effect of gap junctions was actually to, to shunt away spikes because experimentalists had already shown that, that they, they are very good at synchronizing uh, spikes. So to, to convince ourselves that, that we didn't do really a mistake, um, we had to sort of simulate the exact ex experimental setup. And then it is the, the following one that you can inject current into cells and they start to spike. This is the same network that we have here. Uh, and first we have no gap junctions, so they spike uh, a bit asynchronous. And then we introduce gap junctions in the simulation and then they line up perfectly. And then when the gap junctions are removed, then they start to uh, desynchronize again. And so this is quite uh, different. If you have current injection, you get a perfect spike synchronization, but if, if you drive them with, with synaptic input, that is not the case. And moreover, in this uh, setting, when you increase gap junctions conductance, you decrease spiking. But in this setting, if you increase gap junctions conductance, you can increase spiking. And, and in this particular case, it, it's because of a recruitment effect that if all of these cells line up, then they can recruit more, more cells. So that is, I think, a, a, a quite uh, good example that um, that I think that a role for quite biophysically detailed models is really to extrapolate from um, experiments to a more physiological setting. I guess that sometimes you would think that experiments are closer to reality, but I think that doesn't have to be the case, that sometimes you actually have to maybe reproduce some experimental data, but then take it to a more uh, physiologically realistic setting. So that was uh, sort of some work that, that um, uh, exemplified the role of gap junctions for detecting 
uh, synchronous inputs to a gap junction coupled network. And the feed forward inhibition from such FS networks are of course important for controlling spiking in medium spinal neurons and another important factor is of course to control the synaptic strength from cortex to, to medium spinal neurons and here plasticity comes in and as in many other systems there exist um, various experimental paradigms for for LTP and LTD, high frequency stimulation trains or low frequency or theta bursts and, and so on. And over the last five years or so also, uh, STDP experiments have, have become popular. STDP is spike timing dependent plasticity. So here you, you um, um, there is a difference in the, the resulting plasticity LTP or LTD depending on the timing between the presynaptic activation of the neuron and the postsynaptic spike. And for instance, if you have a very sort of uncomplicated situation where only NMDA properties are important and NMDA calcium trigger the uh, plasticity and so on, then what you typically get is that if you start with a presynaptic input followed by a postsynaptic spike, then you get a higher calcium influx because you you remove the magnesium block of, of NMDA, but if you do the opposite, post followed by pre, you get a lower calcium influx. This is not, it's not this simple in, in the medium spine in neurons. So the question that we're, we're asking is how, how the MSN behavior, the medium spine in neuron behavior um, and learning can be controlled by, by both uh, excitatory input, glutamatergic input, but also the presence of uh, GABAergic inputs and particularly when it comes to plasticity. So we collaborate with an experimental group in France that are doing these STDP experiments and they have corticostratal slices and, and then they see the following that if they in the control situation then they actually see that post followed by pre gives LTP the black dots and pre followed by post gives LTD. But their results has not been really in, in accordance with what other labs has, has got. And then they try to nail it down, what is the difference? And then they notice that if you block GABA in the slice, which has been a typical, uh, this is what, what typical people do, then you reverse uh, Plasticity. So then post pre gives LTD and pre post gives LTP. And this is a quite robust situation. It has been tested in mice and in rodents and in, in direct pathway neurons and in indirect pathway neurons and so on. And in all cases, if you have LTP in this case or LTP in this case, it's, it's always dependent on NMDA calcium because if you block NMDA properties, then, then you remove uh, LTP. And this LTD situation is dependent on endocannabinoid production and L-type calcium that is necessary for that. Uh, and if, if, uh, if you block GABA, a lot of things can of course happen. You have the whole, whole a lot of networks effect that can happen. So to, to see whether, whether um, this switching of, of the LTP and LTD in the presence of GABA could be explained on the single cell level, sort of. They did the following experiments that they uh, recorded from two neighboring medium spiny neurons and then they had picrotoxin in the electrode in, in one of these cells. And then when they gave like post followed by a pre-input, these cells behave different. So the control condition there you have LTP and the other one LTD. And the opposite is true if the protocol is pre followed by post. So it seems that the presence of GABA can make a difference for spike time independent plasticity um, in this system or and during these experimental conditions. And it seems that LTP requires NMDA calcium while LTD uh, it does not require NMDA calcium and, and instead rather L-type calcium uh, and endocannabinoid production. So what, what can be, what can happen here? And, and to try to get some idea on that, we, we, ha we have a detailed medium spiny neuron model uh, where we try to 
get the right behavior on, on the back propagating action potentials that goes out in the dendrite. It's TTX dependent and, and we also try to get a reasonable calcium dynamics. And then this cell is stimulated with the same kind of STDP protocol that the experimentalists use. <clears throat> and then we plotted uh, NMDA calcium versus um, L-type calcium. This is L-type calcium, this is NMDA calcium. And the black curve is the control situation and the red curve is when GABA is not around. So both of these uh, types of calcium are elevated because of uh, GABA. And that is not so strange in this system because the GABA reversal potential is um, above the, the resting membrane potential in the slice preparation, at least. So then, uh, and this is of course interesting in itself, but then how, how can this explain the switch between LTP and LTD? And of course we, we don't know the answer, but it's quite interesting that if one plots the ratio between the NMDA calcium and the L-type calcium, it really changes when you go from a GABA-free situation to a control situation where GABA is around. And for the pre followed by post, it, it is sort of in line with, with the observation that this produces LTP, it has a lot of NMDA, and this produces LTD, the ratio switches. And actually it's the opposite thing with the opposite stimulation, uh, but it's, it's not so big. So this is like a starting point for, for trying to generate some hypothesis what is really going on. And then we are already down at the subcellular level when we start to discuss calcium, right? So some background to, to um, the subcellular level and synaptic plasticity in these medium spiny neurons. Uh, so for now we are most interested in, in L LTP actually. And for LTP it has been, so it's, it's sort of known that it requires some protein kinase A activation, maybe some CAM kinase 2 activation. It's not really known in, in the stratum, but in many other places it's, it's like that. And also you cannot um, have too much activity of, of some of the phosphatases that are around. So therefore some years ago we, we, have a, we, had, we built a model of glutamate and dopamine induced receptor induced uh, cascades, the in very initial parts of those, <coughs> and try to ask what are the prerequisites in such networks for activating, for instance, PKA, or um, make sure that we don't activate too much of these uh, phosphatases and so on. And how are these kind of, how are the interactions between these pathways affecting this and so on. And also several other groups have, have um, addressed uh, sort of similar questions in, in yeah, this kind of network sort of. And, and lately, most lately, our collaborators in the US, Brahma Blackwell uh, and her postdoc Oliveira, they re-implemented this uh, network but in a stochastic reaction diffusion model and I will come back to that. So when we have such network, then what are interesting sort of questions to, to ask? So I will mention briefly, comment briefly upon reliability of such deterministic models and also uh, specificity that, that a lot of things remains here. And then I will discuss some ongoing work. And finally, say some words about uh, uh, what, is, what is necessary to test whether these learning rules works in vivo. So when it comes to specificity and reliability, if we start with the re reliability question, if we just re implement this, this network, the previous network, and look at the steps between cyclic MP and PKA in the deterministic model when we give some pulses of dopamine, it could look like this. This is cyclic AMP and then eventually you activate some PKA in this particular <coughs> model. <coughs> but if you if you redo that with the same parameters in the stochastic model, taking into account that if this small network, if this network is in a, a small um, 
uh, part of the cell, such as the spine, it's, it's not so many uh, molecules around for, for some of these um, molecules. So then it looks like that. And in this particular case, it's really difficult to see if there is any production of PKA, right? So this cannot be the case in reality. And in this context, it's, it's interesting that this model has been re-implemented re in, in um, <coughs> a stochastic reaction diffusion um, <coughs> study where they also, in addition, played around with, with um, trying to, to, to hypothesize that, for instance, PKA and adenylate cyclase 5, the <coughs> enzyme producing cyclic AMP, are co-localized, <coughs> and then you can actually solve this problem, <coughs> at least to some extent. And also, Upi Bala has shown this in other contexts uh, several years ago, that if you have like a deterministic model that shows some nice switching behavior, then it can be messed up if you have it <laughs> in a stochastic model taking into account, into account um, the 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 more realistic situation. So that is one thing. Another thing is to come back to this, um, uh, this observation that it seems that in, in, this, in, the, in the medium spiny neurons, LTP and LTD depends on uh, different uh, cascades, not only <coughs> like the calcium level, but also different cascades. So LTP is NMDA dependent and ERK is activated dopamine receptor induced cascades produce PKA and so on. And maybe there is also some PKC required for LTP. <coughs> and for LTD it's, it's different uh, cascades that are important. L-type calcium endocannabinoids and also some nitric oxide seems to be important. <coughs> so then one can ask if you just um, uh, have a, a LTP or an LTD stimulation protocol, then how, why, why does it end up in LTP or in LTD? Because in, if you have a high frequency or low frequency stimulation protocol or an STT protocol, then in all of these cases, so of course some glutamate is there and some dopamine is released <coughs> and some you open up some L-type calcium channels and you activate metabotopic glutamate receptors for sure. And there is also NO around, so you have all of these things all the time, but maybe in different uh, levels. <coughs> and then what can, what can um, decide whether LTP or LTD results? One possibility is of, co of um, course that there is crosstalk between these cascades, so maybe one of the cascades becomes a little bit more activated and then it inhibits the other one, right? There are such indications. <coughs> but also there might be um, dependent on the temporal activation pattern of the different inputs. It's, it's cut here, but temporal activation patterns and, and we are sort of working the, along those lines to <coughs> extend the previous model with ERK. Um, because ERK is, is, um, has been suggested to, to act as a coincidence detector between dopamine and glutamate. And also it's, it's known to be important in, uh, in uh, plasticity, in LTP in this system. <coughs> and ERK also actually is one of these um, necessary molecules to activate P PKM probably in, in this system. PKM SATA. <coughs> so, with such a sort of skeleton, and especially if you add on some extra input to this cyclic AMP uh, part of the network, then you can also address questions related to transient uh, increases or decreases in these modulatory systems, like dopamine or acetylcholine and, and so on. <coughs> and and uh, I, I just should mention that uh, when it comes to ERK and um, the medium spiny neurons, it's, it's, not, it's quite complex, the situation. <coughs> ERK has been studied a lot, not, not necessarily in, in, in the, uh, with, with a question to understand plasticity, but with a question to understand <coughs> like drug addiction or side effects when you have Parkinson's and L-TOPA treatments and so on. So there are a lot of animal knockout models for ERK. <coughs> and 
what is particularly challenging here, what we had a lot of problems with, is that if you knock out one of the <coughs> genes for dopamine type 1 receptor or for the G protein in this system, then uh, you can have effects in one pathway but not in the other. Like if you knock out the D1 receptor to <coughs> a little bit more than 50%, then this pathway is affected but not this pathway. And with GOLF it's actually the opposite. So that was, that's a bit tricky. <coughs> so uh, to be able to, to mimic also these kind of experimental data, we are now wor working with a more complex dopamine model where where we assume that the dopamine receptor and also the GOLF protein can, can <coughs> be in sort of in two compartments. It, it sort of means that it can bind to do two different um, sort of anchoring mo molecules or something like that. But I will not discuss that. I will discuss this uh, ongoing modeling work um, uh, with regard to, to, to plasticity and whether activation uh, pattern could play a role. So, when this network is, is activated with an LTP uh, protocol or an LTD protocol, <coughs> we get much more ERK activation if it's an LTP protocol <coughs> than if it's an LTD protocol. And it's quite interesting, we use the exact same stimulation paradigm that our collaborators in the US uh, have been used when they look at a model they have uh, now for the LTD cascade sort of. So it's quite interesting that in the LTP model that we have, we have more activation of ERK if we give an LTP paradigm instead of an LTD par paradigm and they have the opposite. So that's <coughs> quite interesting that it might be so that uh, for the LTT, LT, LTD and LTP receptor induced cascades the activation pattern might actually select one of these pathways. But <coughs> for sure, there's also some crosstalk between this pathway, maybe leading to competition and so on. <coughs> so uh, eventually, of course, it's necessary to investigate uh, receptor-induced cascades in the context of an active neural network, right? So what we would like to do is to have a detailed neural model, and that is then typically simulated in, in, in one of these uh, simulators. <coughs> and then to place some receptor-induced cascades in, into the spines or dendrites of such uh, neural models, and that is typically um, <coughs> simulated with, with other simulators. And then test whether, whether <coughs> you can get some consistent activation of, of um, kinases or phosphatases that are known to be important for plasticity during ongoing network activity <coughs> to see if uh, such, uh, such mechanisms are robust enough if the network is bombarded with, with ongoing activity and then this uh, <coughs> surrounding network might be implement implemented in NEST or something. So, it's really necessary to <coughs> be able to make simulators talk to each other and we have a, a project uh, ongoing actually together with, with Upi Bala um, <coughs> to try to do this using the music tool. M music is an INCF product that you might know of that is supposed to let simulators talk to each other. <coughs> so. Now we have discussed the microcircuit level and some synaptic integration uh, scenarios that affect maybe synaptic plasticity, medium spine neurons, and <coughs> coincidence detection in, in fast spike into neural networks. And also we have <coughs> seen that maybe there is some, some uh, competition between pathways or maybe some um, temporal pattern that. Um, uh, either preferably leads to LTP or LTD. And to look at synaptic effects on the systems level, I thought I could show you some, some ongoing work that relate to short-term <coughs> synaptic dynamics. So 
it has sort of lately been, been um, shown that in many parts of the basal ganglia there is either short-term facilitation <coughs> or short-term depression in, in the synapses. For instance, these fast spiking neurons uh, inhibition of median spinal neurons, uh, there is a powerful uh, depression. <coughs> and in the direct pathway between the stratum, medium spiny neurons onto SNR, the, the output nu nucleus of the basal ganglia, one of those, there is facilitation, and here you have uh, depression and so on. So just to give an example, yeah, so at this level, at sort of the systems level, <coughs> we, we <coughs> sort of use quite um, not so detailed models, integrated fire or Sikiewicz models, try to be tuned to electrophysiological data with conductance-based synapses and most importantly um, <coughs> synapse uh, models that can capture these short-term plasticity zodics, Markram uh, models. <coughs> this is just to, to show one example. In experiments, uh, this shows that when you uh, activate uh, these synapsis, synapsis between direct pathway medium spinal neurons and SNR, it facilitates. And this is in the simulations, the conductance. And then one, ca one can of course ask, so how many medium spinal neurons are necessary to suppress one SNR, taking into account that they facilitate, and what is the role of this short-term synaptic plasticity on, on the system's level? This is just an example. <coughs> so, first of all, if, if, having, if asking such questions like how many medium spiny neurons are necessary and so on, you also have to make some educated <laughs> guesses of how the network is coupled. And, and yeah, we assume that at most 500 medium spiny neurons can project on one uh, SNR neuron, but probably fewer. This is just a simulation where we have 100 presynaptic medium spiny neurons. So this is a population of 100 medium spiny <coughs> neurons that are activated with some low frequency. And this is a synaptic, uh, the, the synaptic activation frequency in a postsynaptic SNR neuron. So to increase that uh, active, uh, act, uh, inhibition of SNR and thus uh, suppress the tonic inhibition of SNR. We can increase the activity in the presynaptic MSM pool in different ways. Either, either we can uh, uh, recruit some bursting medium spiny neurons or we can increase the uh, spiking of, of the whole presynaptic medium spiny network, right? Like this. And if we take this situation and compare it with that situation and look at the <coughs> how, how the SNR cell is affected, then this is much more effective in inhibiting the SNR cell than this is, right? And this is, of course, because the synapses are facilitatory. So facilitatory synapses, of course, filter out this background low. Uh, firing MSN, uh, but they can detect bursting MSNs. And in this particular case, it makes perfect sense, and you could have sort of guessed it, but, but this is sort of a, a, a quantification of, of that effect. And uh, one can sort of go, go on with adding other inputs and addressing what happens if you have an MSN burst together with a GPE burst or a GPE pause in the same postsynaptic SNR. <coughs> and it's quite inter interesting that if you have, uh, this is actually shows a simulation like, like that, this is a frequency in the SNR. When you just test the importance of the MSN burst, then it suppresses the frequency. If you have in addition <coughs> a GPE burst, then it suppresses the SNR activity much earlier. So it, this is, so it seems to be very good to have an MSN burst together with a GPE burst um, if you want to suppress a postsynaptic SNR cell really quickly. <coughs> and, and these GPE bursts or pauses, um, it's not so that the whole presynaptic GPE pool are bursting or pausing, it's just like 20% of those. So also in the case 
uh, where the GPE, 20% of the GPE pulses <coughs> during the time when an MSN is bursting, it can actually interfere. So if we define a certain threshold for when the SNR cell is sort of inhibited, then it could be so that if 20% of the presynaptic GP, GPE pool is pausing, then the MSNs cannot really make this uh, suppression of activity. And this is quite interesting <coughs> in, in relation to yeah, Parkinson's and so on, when the GPE pool becomes much more bursty. <coughs> so, that's, uh, so that is what, what we are doing. Then just a couple of words about this, the Swedish INCF node activities. <coughs> so the INCF nodes, node activities are sort of organized uh, quite much around Stockholm Brain Institute. And the Stockholm Brain Institute consists of groups at the Karolinska Institute and Stockholm University and also Royal Institute of Technology, KTH. <coughs> and there the aim has been to study higher brain functions from different perspectives during a lot of approaches like imaging, computational modeling, and experiments. <coughs> and also, um, lately there has um, something called the Swedish eScience Research Center has formed. And it, it is formed by almost the same universities, KTH, Stockholm University, Karolinska Institute, and then <coughs> another university in, in Sweden, around uh, uh, high performance computing uh, facilities. <coughs> so now we also interact or are part of this uh, CERC. It has a disease community and, and uh, uh, so it, it fits very nicely also with the collaboration with some of the companies. So current activities and plans is to increase the interactions with researchers outside the Stockholm area sort of and, and we have done that through uh, neuroinformatics PhD courses. Uh, joint applications and so on. We have quite interesting uh, uh, activities going on uh, in another part of Sweden where, where they manufacture and use uh, uh, electrodes for, for in vivo recording. So it's sort of brain machine interfacing and, and that could be very, very good if we could start to collaborate uh, between those uh, centers. Also we participate in some INCF task forces programs and also the uh, Swedish eScience Research Center, they have employed and recruited a neuroinformatics application expert that is going to help out with both modeling, especially high performance computing uh, issues, and also imaging. And we have participated in, in the preparation of this EU Human Brain Project flagship and hosted some conferences. We will also host the Neuroinformatics Congress 2000. Uh, uh, or, or next year. And also I will just mention something about a joint PhD program that we have. It's called Eurospin. <coughs> it's within the uh, Erasmus Mundus uh, EU programs. So the objective of this doctoral training program is to provide um, uh, uh, to top quality training for PhD students within neuroinformatics and especially computational neuroscience. <coughs> and four partners participate. It's KTH, Edinburgh, and it's NCBS in, in Bangalore, and it's University of Freiburg, and some associated partners. So if any one of you, or if you know someone who is interested in, in applying to, uh, to, to be a joint student between some of these um, <coughs> universities, then you should go to, to this website and fill in your, your uh, name and so on, and it's deadline in the end of this month. So please, please spread the word. Uh, and yeah, and we have actually some, some, someone from India also in, in the program. So that goes very well. Okay, thanks. Are you going to also put in some uh, uh, abstract modeling or coupling to, uh, uh, to, to some of the motor physical physical instance instantiation of this S some what some motor system like you know some actual uh, yeah i mean we have this uh, on ongoing work that Stian discussed yeah. where where the basal ganglia can can control motor system and that is really nice because then we have we have 
actually a very good um, quantitative knowledge of, of that system. So, so I mean, th this is ongoing, yes, of course. But I didn't take that here. I just took things that had to do with synaptic integration. <laughs> and also Sten already talked about it. But I mean, this is really a resource that, um, I mean, a good, good reason for, for modeling motor systems as such is, of course, that you can figure out what, what is the purpose of something that the system is doing. And, and uh, now, the, since we know the, a lot of the motor output, like the brainstem and spinal cord, then we can also much better interpret like what the basal ganglia output has to uh, cope with, right? <coughs> I, sorry. No, so just to follow that up, I mean, are you looking at a systematic approach to uh, abstraction that is you know, it's, it's a question that I get asked all the time, so I thought I'd ask you. Um, a systematic way of saying, here's my very detailed model, and now I, I have a, a way of taking those lessons so that I can apply them to bigger systems without doing the horrible calculations. I guess that is what, what we already want. Uh, already, oh, every one of us really want to understand the brain, right? So we have to do that, right? We have no choice. But I guess we have to go into these details to, to figure out. And I, I think that these uh, receptor-induced cascades uh, can actually, it seems to be very detailed, but actually if, if you can understand like timing requirements in those, you actually already know a lot on the systems level, like you have some constraints. So I think it's it really fits together, but it's a lot of things th that remains. <laughs> Maybe I can add one more to the to-do list. Um, but I think for, for, for first time, I think I, I understand the need for very, very detailed models. So could we think of extending these models to ask for the role of dopamine on plasticity? Because in triad and dopamine also modulates <coughs> even the sign of the foot plasticity, not just... Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that is... So how far these models are, like, are they in some stage where you can add one or two extra cascade and ask this question, or is it some other works? Uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah you, can <coughs> you can actually do it on, on different levels. So if you have a really detailed compartmentalized models with hosting huxley current, then you uh, can already, you, you can sort of... Uh, up or down regulate some of the currents that are known to be to be modulated by, for instance, dopamine. And this has partly been been done by by, the, by others. So that you can do. But but of course you can. And then of course based on that you can you can you can you can quantify the effects and then like <coughs> use it use it even in an integrating fire neuron like like uh, Humph Humphreyan. Gurney has done, right? So that is an, an attempt. And then, of course, you can have a top-down model. Uh, yeah. One short question, I think it's more technical. What I didn't understand is about the role of GABA on plasticity. I thought that in SLICE there is no activity. Yeah, there is actually activity because they stimulate. Yeah, so, so first of all, there is a lot of, um, of um, <coughs> tonic GABA activity in these neurons. And that has been measured, and we have that in the model, actually, but I didn't show it. So there is a lot of tonic GABA, but there is also, since they, they, stim they have a corticostratal slice, they stimulate cortex, or, or these uh, axons from the cortex, right? And then they measure in the medium spiny neurons. But if they measure in a fast spike into neurons, with, which they have done, that neuron spikes much earlier and much more. So they always have this feed-forward inhibition in their preparation, but of course not if they block uh, with picrotoxin. So these are the pair for the process? Yeah, it is, sort of. Oh, but I mean, they just have an, uh, an electrode that stimulates the input to the, to the stratum in a quite unspecific way, and then they record from a single uh, medium spiny neuron, for instance, or a fast spike into neurons or something. So I think actually that, that this, uh, whatever, I mean, this is still just a slice preparation, so it's still not physiological, but, but I think that really this is an interesting example that um, it's very dependent on these details. And then one could question, how is it in reality? <laughs> because this is not reality either. If, even if they have this GABA uh, there, it's still not ongoing activity and so on. So <laughs> it's a lot of challenging. Uh, tasks in front of us, right? <coughs> uh, 
in the results that you have shown uh, for subcellular model, uh, I see. Uh, so you connect this to uh, a next level. Uh, for example, the subcellular signaling pathway, some modulation within that affects firing rates of medium spiny neurons. You have some. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done that, but I mean that is of course where what we would like to do. And UPI has also tried to do that. Like maybe ERC is doing some phosphorylation of, of some potassium channels, or, or yeah, you, you can look at these things. So that is, that will take some time. But <clears throat> but eventually, I think someone in the field has to do these things in a, in a large scale way, way to really figure out that the principles that that you believe in are really working, right? Any further questions?